Okay. Uh, tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah, uh, Roger uh, McGrath, that's capital MC, capital GR, AT is in Tom H. Um, and I did many things, but uh, for this, I was a, um, I taught history at uh, local university here, UCLA, and also at Pepperdine. And among my history courses was a military history of World War II, and half of it focused on the Pacific theater of the war. And uh, one of the um, books that I had students read for that was Lieutenant Ramsey's War. Now you said that uh, <coughs> that bef you were you found out about Ed in his book when you were uh, call contacted by his wife Racky, correct? Tell us about how that unfolded. Yeah. Now, do you want me to refer to Mrs. Ramsey or Racky or how we? Uh, Racky is fine. Everybody will know by this point. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I first met Ed Ramsey through his wife, Racky. I was teaching at UCLA and she got a hold of me. Uh, she knew I taught military history courses and she knew I spent much of the time on the Pacific. I uh, taught a uh, Pacific uh, Theater of the War uh, seminar, in fact, a senior seminar. She got a hold of me and I, I met Ed and that was just at the time that the, uh, the book was being published and being launched. And I met Ed, in fact, at his, uh, at his residence in West Los Angeles. Uh, and the first thing I thought about Ed, that the years didn't seem to add up right. Uh, yeah, my wife and I both uh, came over, were invited over for uh, dinner by the Ramseys. And Ed, to me, looked like he was in his late 40s. Uh, and he was actually about 70 years old. Um, and that's no hyperbole, no exaggeration. I asked my wife too, and she said, oh, 47, 48, uh, just absolute freak of nature. And moreover, you think about what he'd been through. He'd been down to 93 pounds, suffering from every tropical disease imaginable, had his appendix out without any anesthesia in the jungles of the Philippines, uh, uh, chased uh, for over three years by Japanese troops. Um, and how he could survive all that and look like somebody who was uh, one of these physical culture uh, fitness gurus. Uh, I mean, just absolutely stunningly uh, young in appearance and also in vitality, uh, yeah, full, of, uh, full of energy, vim, vigor in, in life. Uh, and you came from some of a, somewhat of a military background yourself? Yeah. I, I, when I met Ed, of course, I, by then I was a Marine uh, veteran, uh, and so I could appreciate uh, very much uh, what he'd gone through, especially his guerrilla warfare. Uh, I mean, the Army considers him uh, one of the first of their special forces. And the U.S. Army made formally, officially, Ed Ramsey uh, a member of the special forces. He became a Green Beret. And after all, he was the pioneer of that entire force, a pioneer independently on his own in the jungles of the Philippines. I found many military histories to be biased towards uh, Europe and to give the Pacific short shrift. And I mean, that's what happened to all the men on Bataan. They were promised relief, which uh, never came. Uh, Roosevelt was uh, focused uh, primarily on Europe and thought the Pacific could wait. And that meant the sacrifice of uh, 75,000 men on Bataan to the Japanese with horrific consequences. And I always thought, well, if I ever taught a military history course, um, I'm certainly going to give the Pacific its, its due and share it equally. And also growing up, I, I grew up here right on the, the beaches of Southern California, and uh, my older brother was old enough to be one of the kids who helped patrol the bluffs of Pacific Palisades, watching for uh, Japanese in December of 41 and January, February, March, April of 42. We, everybody along the coast here thought a Japanese invasion was imminent. And it was no joke because Japanese submarines were sinking ships within sight of the coast, right right off our shores here. 
up, up and down from Southern California up to, uh, to Monterey Bay. Uh, so people that lived here and grew up here were probably as much focused on the Pacific for good reason as they were on the, the war in Europe. Uh, and then also uh, later on, I, I myself became a Marine. And the Marines, of course, serve not in Europe, but there's a, some rare exceptions, but in the Pacific. And the, the march uh, from Guadalcanal and then up the Central Pacific was, uh, it is a huge part of Marine history, the lore of, of the Marine Corps. So for a number of reasons, I, I didn't want to uh, diminish the contribution of all the troops who served in, in the Pacific. And of course, one of the key locations in the, in the Pacific was the, the Philippines. And the whole story about this, the largest surrender in American history since the Civil War occurred on the Bataan Peninsula. Uh, so this was one of these watershed events in American history. And then of course the whole lore with MacArthur. And then later in life, to, to run into an American soldier who did not surrender at Bataan, but went into the bush and eventually led 40,000 Filipino guerrillas in this war against the Japanese uh, was one of the highlights of my, my life uh, for several reasons. Even before I met Ed, I had, I had changed uh, much of my mind about uh, MacArthur. Uh, obviously, I was oriented towards the Department of the Navy <laughs> and within the Department of the Navy, the Marine Corps. And uh, MacArthur, of course, was not one of the shining figures, you know, to, to the Navy. Um, however, the more I read about him, including William Manchester's book, American Caesar, uh, changed my opinion about him. Uh, I, I'm afraid I had a certain bias uh, perspective. And the more I read about him, the more I learned that uh, much of we, that we thought about uh, MacArthur in the Philippines, uh, the appropriate uh, phrase, dug out Doug. Well, all of that was untrue. In fact, he was facing court-martial for disobeying a direct order from the President of the United States not to be evacuated. Uh, he also visited the frontline troops on Bataan. He walked on the front. And if you read anything about MacArthur in World War I, uh, I mean, he was a, a brilliant commander in the field and a daring and bold commander exposed himself to more fire than any of his troops suffered. Uh, so I had already changed my opinion uh, greatly. And then meeting Ed Ramsey, somebody who knew him personally, had personal contact with him. And uh, Ed's uh, strong views on MacArthur, not only MacArthur's strategic vision but his honor and his dignity, um, I prob probably put the uh, final um, uh, final element in the, the whole equation that added up to my view of, of MacArthur. Uh, and I, I think um, that he's unfortunately been treated rather uh, shabbily by much of uh, the media and then of course his ultimate downfall with Truman in Korea. But if you go back and look at his in, entire history, he's absolutely one of the great figures in American military history, period. You know, I've often said Ed's life is one of great irony. I mean, uh, just the fact that uh, his, his mother sent him off, and he, he agreed, to the Oklahoma Military Academy when he was kind of a wild teenage kid. That's essentially what Ed was. I mean, he patronized bootleggers as a teenager in Wichita, Kansas, where he did most of his growing up. And so here's this guy with the wild hair and a bit out of control, and he goes off to a military academy. Well, instead of getting into trouble there, he thrives there. Not only thrives there, but he uh, becomes one of their 
elite polo players. <laughs> so here, here's a kid with out some kind of aristocratic background who could afford a string of polo ponies, something you think was for reserved for the Eastern establishment. This wild kid from Wichita, Kansas, and he, he becomes a top polo player at the Oklahoma Military Academy and later in the U.S. Cavalry. But that for Ed fed into how he perceived himself as something of a Tyrone Power or Errol Flynn. He thought once he was commissioned, well, now I'm an officer, a gentleman, and also a playboy. And of course, his first posting in the Army of the 11th Cavalry was Camp uh, Marino in the hills in the back country of San Diego. But that many could spend every weekend at the El Cortez Hotel in the Sky Room, <laughs> dancing with one lovely after another. And uh, this was all to Ed's liking. Uh, however, posted up there in the back country of San Diego, which people don't appreciate, gets really cold in the winter. There's some uh, mountainous terrain back there. I mean, one of our national observatories, Mount Palomar, is back in there. And believe me, up on the top of Mount Palomar in the winter, it is frigid. And the uh, Navy has its Sears School. It's all uh, Marines and Navy personnel. When they go through survival training, you go through the Sears School at Warner Springs in the back country of San Diego. And part of that is to endure the bitter cold there during, during the winter. So he didn't like that. He thought, uh, well, there's this place I've heard about. And he asked some other people about it out there in the Western Pacific, somewhere in Southwest Pacific, called the Philippines. That's all he knew. And he, he was told it was warm all year round. And they have the 26th uh, Philippine Scouts there, this cavalry outfit. And not only that, but they had one of the best polo teams anywhere and they played top polo teams. And they had beautiful women. <laughs> and Ed said, that's for me, April 1941. Of course, he didn't know what was coming. But <laughs> so by June, he's down in the Philippines. And it was absolutely to his liking because there the U.S. Army, and especially the cavalry, was uh, something of imperial image. It was, it, was, it was something like some old British regiment in the old British Empire. And uh, they, they dressed um, for, uh, uh, for mess and, and for dining in and dining out. Uh, they had many formal occasions uh, and they played polo. Uh, and there he was stationed at Fort Stotzenberg, which included Clark uh, Field. The, the air base there. It was all the Army, because there was no Air Force then. It was the U.S. Army Air Corps. So we had our B-17s there and some fighters, uh, as well as the Army barracks. But they also had the Philippine Scouts, the 26th Cavalry Regiment. And that was ideal for Ed. They had houseboys that did all the basic upkeep uh, for their quarters. Um, and they went to dances on the weekends in Manila, which was something of an international uh, city, uh, very vibrant and um, with all the kind of uh, tropical uh, scents and aromas and uh, flowering boulevards. All of this was very exciting to him. And he thought, I've done it. This is, this is the life I always wanted. And here they were preparing for one of the big polo matches. And in the stands, I mean, the, the commander there was General Wainwright, Skinny Wainwright, Jonathan Wainwright, and other dignitaries. And uh, they're preparing for this big match on the, the morning of December 7th, 1941. And there they played their game against the top Philippine polo team. Uh, and it was a, a great game, it was. Uh, and Ed was there, one of the top players, and, and noticed very prominently by uh, General Wainwright. And he just thought he had chosen the best posting in the entire U.S. Army. And 12 hours later, 
they learned the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. He woke up with a terrible hangover after this polo match because as tradition has it, then the teams get together and they drink till the wee hours of the morning. And that's just what he did. And he woke up with a splitting headache to news that the Japanese had perpetrated a sneak attack on Pearl Harbor and we were at war. Now, he knew should war erupt, the most vulnerable were the U.S. troops in the Philippines. An intelligence officer had told them just two weeks earlier, he said with uh, a southern drawl, this officer had, he said, uh, are you uh, religious, Ed? And Ed said, well, not particularly. And he said, well, you better give your soul to God because your ass belongs to the Japanese. <laughs> So that in, intel officer, he knew something was up. And he knew the Philippines were terribly vulnerable. And of course, just two weeks later, on the 17th of December, the Japanese did invade at Lingayen Gulf. And uh, with uh, a force that uh, simply outnumbered the American, combined force of American and uh, Filipinos, uh, by, by a great number, and, and especially with air power, and naval support, mechanized divisions, everything. I mean, General Hama was going to take the Philippines in 50 days. And by one heroic stand after another, the Americans held out for six months. But now Ed was suddenly, from this, this playboy playing polo, and living what he thought was the best life imaginable in the army. Now he was in, th in the, th the thick of World War II, facing an overwhelming Japanese enemy. And after three weeks of um, continual fighting and great suffering, uh, Ed went into the bush with a few other officers, they decided that, no, I'm sorry, I messed up there. <clears throat> but I'll pick. Three weeks, long. Yeah, no. After three weeks of continual uh, fighting, his particular troop of the 26th uh, Cavalry was allowed to withdraw. But what they had done was by time. And the 26th Cavalry took a tremendous hill, hits uh, uh, north of Manila, between Manila and, and uh, Lingayen Gulf on this great plain of Luzon. But they had slowed the advance of the, the Japanese because the Japanese had to stop and send out skirmishers and uh, move troops over here and try to flank there. And all this slowed down their advance. But the 26th Cavalry, essentially, by the time Ed was uh, allowed to withdraw back into our lines, had pretty much ceased to exist. They'd taken such uh, tremendous casualties, especially those who had been up there around Lingayen Gulf. Um, and now they, uh, oh, excuse me, let me think about this. <clears throat> After resting, hardly at all, and terribly low on supplies, General Wainwright himself sent Ed Ramsey up to Morong. Morong was a village uh, a little bit below Subic Bay in Longapo, and it was on the, the south bank of a river, and it seemed to offer an ideal position to form a defensive line to slow the Japanese uh, southward advance. And Wainwright uh, recognized uh, Ramsey from the polo match. And, uh, and, and that probably was Ed Ramsey's undoing in a sense because he thought, oh, he would be good to lead a troop of cavalry up there on their horses. And that's just what happened to Ed. He led this troop of cavalry up this coastal uh, road, which mm, less a road than a a terrible rutted trail. 
And they came into the village of Morong, but the Japanese had already crossed the river, across, some wading across, some across a small little bridge, and they had already invested the village of Morong. And there Ed, in the best of cavalry tradition, like something out of a John Ford movie, except not with sabers, the Army had abandoned Samers in 1935, and now with their 45s, Ed simply yelled, Charge! And with 45s and the horses galloping into the village of Moran, Ed led this troop of cavalry. Uh, this was shock and awe. Instead of with modern technology, this could have been a thousand or two thousand years ago. And here they went into that village, and the Japanese were shocked at these horses galloping and snorting and rearing, and the men on their backs hanging over the necks of the horses, firing their 45s. And the Japanese broke, ran, scattered. And it also threw those troops crossing uh, the river into confusion, because now men were backing up into the river. And for this and for holding Morong, uh, as it turns out, Ed was later awarded the Silver Star. And he was recommended for it by an officer sent forward by Wainwright uh, to bring back some intel on what was happening at Morong. And Ed saw this, this officer, he didn't know who he was, he thought it was somebody that uh, should have been up there at the front and in the thick of the fight. And Ed yelled out at him, he said, you yellow son of a bitch! Because this officer was kind of poking his head out from behind a hut and observing things. And, and Ed then went on and continued in the battle and the fight, wounded himself, um, all of this. It later turned out that officer <laughs> was a member of Wainwright's staff and he'd been sent up there as superior officer had been sent up there to bring back intel he wasn't supposed to be in the fight <laughs> and for good reason he was trying to take cover and observe well that officer <laughs> who had called the yellow son of a bitch was the officer who recommended Ed Ramsey for the Silver Star and he was later decorated with that Silver Star and that charge of horses was the last mounted cavalry charge in U.S. history. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm... Uh, I, get a, that, yeah, I get a drink after yeah. my long soliloquy. That was fabulous. Cook a cup for a second. That